sun. Sunrise. I grumbled about the sunrise part of my job in the last ministry that I had. We did, you see, a Unitarian Universalist sunrise service every Easter morning. We would get there. In order to do a service at sunrise, you have to get there before sunrise. And there in the East Coast, before sunrise, it was often quite cold and dark, as it was in fact here this morning at sunrise today. It was especially difficult when Easter was the week right after the time change. That was never good. <laughs> and we would huddle in the cold and the dark and be just a small band of singing UUs waiting for Easter and honoring a miracle that few of us literally believed in. <laughs> and yet, we were there because we did believe in something, a spirit. And those services became very important to me, and I actually started to want to be the one who got up well before dawn to be there to greet the sun and be part of that little band of hopeful, if somewhat confused, people greeting another Easter sunrise. And each year here at our Seder dinner, which is always fashionably late, because this is when we host winter nights every year, it will be as it is every year, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, slightly after Passover. And it's one of our most treasured gatherings. We read from the Haggadahs of different families and we have the leadership of our members with Jewish ancestry. We eat a few of the ritual foods and we say our own version of the important lessons. And it always amazes me how even the most rambunctious of our children are often, especially still for that one service, it's as if they can honor something that is timeless and wise in it that holds their attention the ways that other services don't seem to do. The marking of these holidays is like the marking of spring. It allows us to touch and be touched by timeless truths about the return of light and warmth and growth and nurture and nature around us, about the return of truths that perhaps our daily lives do not allow us to truly embrace. Ours is a living tradition. And so while religion binds us to these traditions every year, we're invited in to reinterpret and know them anew. We could skip them, these complicated days, and yet to do so would be to deny ourselves their hope and their promise. Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, who in 1974 became the second woman in history to be ordained as a rabbi, says this about the deep significance of Passover for our Jewish kin. It's not just an ancient story, she says. It's our story, too. For all of us, we were in Egypt and we, too, were freed. The whole story of the Exodus forms the basis of most moral legislation in Judaism, and it is, in fact, the basis of our Jewish and Christian ethics, which inform our overall society. We are told, she says, to care for the stranger, why? Because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. We are supposed to be concerned for the oppressed. Why? Because we were slaves in the land of Egypt. Constantly, references to caring for the stranger and the oppressed are throughout our tradition, and it's all based, she says, upon the fact that we once experienced this ourselves, and no others do now. And that Easter story, John Shelby Spong, the Episcopal bishop disciplined by the church for his progressive views, wrote this, human life is lived within all sorts of safety barriers, protective fences and limiting forces. These barriers create loneliness, isolation, fear. They enable many of us to exist without living or to content ourselves with living in the safest and most shallow of levels. 
The ultimate barrier of death creates the deepest fear, the deepest vulnerability, and perhaps worst of all, he says, the presence of death lurking with its sense of inevitability on the edges of our consciousness prevents many of us from daring to live fully. Hence, our Easter story touches a very deep chord inside us. For if the ultimate barrier of death can be breached or has been breached, then perhaps there are countless levels of life that can be experienced. So Easter, he says, appeals to our hidden dreams, to our forlorn hopes that life is more than we experience it in living and that all the barriers of life, including the final barrier of death, may be finite. There is enormous possibility in that. So here we stand in the midst of the season of Passover and Easter, the most important holidays for the two traditions from whence we spring in our deep ancestry, the Jewish and Christian traditions, asking what does this all mean for us? We know the baggage of traditional beliefs and they are like stones sometimes in front of the mouth of the cave which we wish to get out of to see new light. It's like that cave in which Jesus' followers in the story had to roll away the stones in order to anoint his body and progress to the miracle of his resurrection. But for us, the stone is the idea of a physical resurrection which does not make sense to us or the idea that we should celebrate a story about the salvation of the Jewish people at the cost of the Egyptian people. I thought about this a lot this year, about what Spong calls the Easter moment, and also about the teachings of Rabbi Sasso. And I thought about why they are important to us. Both of these rituals come at a time when the natural rhythms of the earth are also reminding us of the truth beyond words, which is our connection to the earth. Sasso says that each year at the Seder, we can remind ourselves to be people who embrace the other without hate. The most striking thing about the Exodus story, she says, is that it imagines another way of looking at reality. One could assume that the world is so structured that there is always master and slave, always oppressed and oppressor, and that's just the way it is. But the Exodus says, no, God suffers with the people who are suffering, and in some ways, that peep, the God regrets the suffering of the Egyptians. We may not recognize it at first in the story because there are the plagues and walking through the sea to freedom where the Egyptians are drowned. But there is a wonderful rabbinic midrash, she says, which tells us that the angels were about to sing when the Israelites crossed the sea to freedom and God stops them, saying, but my people are also drowning and this is not the time to sing. We are reminded through this interpretation of the Passover that we celebrate only when all people are free and that is where we find our joy. Sasso and Spong remind us that in each tradition people struggle to connect these old stories to our, their lives today in ways that can be changeable and subject to today's interpretation. Resurrection is not just something that occurs beyond time in a moment that's just one mythical day of judgment, Spong says. We are resurrected into ever-expanding cycles of life every time love touches our lives, calls us out of our shells, and dares us to risk living while endowing us with the courage to be ourselves. Love lifts us up, stands us on our feet, and it gives us the courage to live again, to dare again, to risk loving again. That is resurrection. It is love giving life, love breaking into our loneliness. When we know love, we are lifted back into life, life that can never be totally destroyed again. The Jewish authorities, having been deeply troubled by the Jesus movement, wanted to make sure that the execution of Jesus, Spong says, in fact killed the whole movement. But the martyrdom of Jesus fueled a movement rather than terminated it, and that is the place of hope. 
This must be a season for resurrection in, of hope in our world, a world in which some of us greet this season for the first time since the death of a, of a beloved or when life is in transition, where we are unsure or lonely or afraid. But we celebrate these weeks with our religious ancestors, celebrating with those disciples who rolled away the stones of grief and loss from their own hearts to realize that their teacher lived on in the shared vision of community. We celebrate these weeks with our religious ancestors, celebrating that they were in fact passed over when their neighbors were not, and wondering what this meant for how precious their lives were and how they should dedicate them to freedom. The Easter moment, the Passover moment, is about choosing hope. It is about that choice. It doesn't necessarily mean that we know what to do right after we make that choice, because it doesn't mean the path is clear, but it does mean that we must choose hope. So I know it was cold at sunrise this morning, because me and the dogs, we were out there. They couldn't quite understand it. Usually they get food first and then the walk. They like it that way, food first, very important. Today it was walk first and then food. Not so good, but there they were. The older dogs are now deaf, so they can't really hear the singing of the sunrise service. But the younger one was sure that the service would be enhanced if each and every celebrant were kissed full, full frontally in the face by a pit bull. <laughs> Luckily, we were on the other side of the street. This morning, I was a little late, and uh, they were a little overeager, and we caught just a little bit of the singing and the rumble of the preaching. But I do want to say that this morning, as they were singing and the sun was rising over the Brioni Hills, the moon, which was almost full, was setting on the other side. We cannot know the wind or the way the spirit moves. We cannot know exactly what to do after we choose hope and possibility. But we do know that nothing else is possible until we make that choice. We need to resurrect our hope in humankind, to resurrect the knowledge we have of our deep connection to this healing earth and the ways we are held by it. Rabbi Sasso says this, we don't have to take a text literally to take it seriously. I take the text seriously. It has a profound truth to teach us. The miracle of the Exodus for me is not in the contradiction of physical nature, but in the refashioning of human nature. Our commitment is to a recommitment in the birth of the human spirit and the rebirth of the human spirit again and again in times of adversity and in times of hope. So let us remember that there will be a new day, as our children sang, that we can open our hearts. Let us roll away the stones of disbelief today and resurrect our hope in the wind and the rain, the sun and the moon, and our faith in the internal possibility of the human spirit. Let today be a reminder that regardless if that we, we know what the long arc of the future will take us, we can always take that first step, which is to choose hope and love and possibility. May we be the ones to make it so.